Welcome to Education Matters presented by the Public School Forum of North Carolina. I'm your host, Tom Williams. Lawmakers recently adjourned their legislative session without reaching a compromise with Governor Cooper on teacher salaries, leaving educators to head into the holidays without pay raises for the 2019-20 school year. On today's show, we'll hear from two North Carolina teachers about how the lack of salary increases, along with other challenges, is impacting their lives in classrooms. We'll also hear from two lawmakers, a Democrat and Republican, about their efforts to negotiate teacher pay raises and how they plan to move forward. Before we tackle our main topics, we open with headlines, our quick scan of education headlines across North Carolina and the U.S. Our first headline is actually the subject of today's show, addressing the teacher pay stalemate. Teachers and supporters held walk-ins last week, picketing outside schools before the start of the school day. The General Assembly and Governor Cooper have yet to agree on a state budget, leaving some school districts unable to hire counselors and educators without pay raises for the current school year. The legislator proposed 3.9 percent raises for teachers, but Governor Cooper vetoed it, stating that it was inadequate. He proposed nearly a 9 percent pay raise back in July. State Superintendent Mark Johnson where, uh, announced where $73 million in school construction grant funds will be distributed. The funds, which originated from the North Carolina Education Lottery, will be used to build new schools in Camden, Graham, Hertford, Northampton, Rutherford, and Wilson counties. The largest amount that can be given to any county is $15 million, and the law requires that each county matches the funds, ranging from one-third of the amount to one-to-one, -to -one equaling the funds awarded. Coming up, some elementary schools across the state will be assessing reading with a new computer-based program called iStation. Even though the legal fight continues in deciding whether the multi-million dollar contractor for the program was properly awarded, iStation is the only reading assessment tool that the state is funding a decision that was made back in July by State Superintendent Mark Johnson, but that he made against the recommendation by an evaluation committee he formed. Some school districts have stated they cannot wait for a legal decision over whether or not iStation will be ultimately the reading assessment program endorsed and funded by the state, as they're required by state law to test students on their reading skills now. Remember, you can visit the Public School Forum website at ncforum.org, and click Education Matters and read more about each of the headlines as well as other topics we cover each week. I'd like to welcome to our show Rick Horner, a Republican representing Johnston and Nash counties, and Representative Darren Jackson, a Democrat from Wake County. Thank you, Senator Horner and Representative Jackson, for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Good to be here. Great. Um, so, Representative Jackson, let's. Um, begin by saying we're heading into the holiday season. Um, we're without any pay raises right now for the teachers, other than the step increases that you all continue to fund. And Governor R Cooper originally proposed a 9 percent um, pay raise. Republican lawmakers uh, came back with a proposal that was 3.9 percent, that the governor then called inadequate and vetoed the budget. Talk to us about why pay negotiations have stalled at this point. Thank you, Tom. I, you know, I don't know that I even, I would, uh, classified as being stalled, I don't think they've really ever started. So uh, back in July when the budget was released, originally in Governor Cooper's budget he asked for about, I think it was 9.1 percent average teacher pay increase. Um, when the legislature passed the budget, it contained a 3.9 percent pay increase. Uh, the governor and the House and the Senate Democrats got together and put back a counter proposal that lowered that number to 8.5 percent, and that's where we've been stuck at since then. There's been no response uh, from the Republican leadership. Senator Horner, um, we of course want to hear your perspective on it as well, and we understood that maybe the Democratic lawmakers tried to negotiate with the Republican leadership on having, a, in late October, of a proposal that included a 6.5 percent uh, pay increase for teachers that appeared to maybe not go anywhere. And so what happened and why do you think the Senate ended up with a proposal that didn't work out? Well, <clears throat> it, it started a little earlier than late October. I began getting the governor's compromise list in uh, September 30th is when I got a copy of it. And I, that six and a half number uh, came from something I worked out. And I worked uh, and I went straight to my Repu uh, Democrat colleagues in the Senate trying to see if we could do this. See, no one will, either either from the governor's side or our side, would commit 
to a firm number or, or the Democratic leadership, uh, but you got to get a conversation started. So six and a half was splitting the baby. Um, and then we he looked at other things like these community college folks, two and a half each, uh, much more than they, even the governor asked for. I want to do everybody at five. Uh, and that was just a conversation. That was about $187 million the first year, 338 the second year in new funds. And uh, we got pretty close on it, um, really close. Uh, we, we, were, we delayed adjourning in October at the very end that you're talking about by about four hours because they were in the room trying to see if they could do it. And, and the deal breaker was if we could get there, they weren't going to override the veto. They just wanted to... Uh, education only, and uh, we're trying to get the whole budget passed. Uh, that that was the offer, uh, but we never got to six and a half. I'll tell you that. Uh, okay, there, there's a lot more to it, but so we're at the point that we're at right now. Obviously, uh, folks want to see the budget move forward and see the pay raises move forward. We're at the current stalemate where it is right now. Uh, what do you think uh, needs to be done to help move not only the teacher pay raises forward, but also the entire budget? Well, what we found is, you know, that we were at a log jam in July when the proposals were flying back and forth. And um, whether you um, were you're on the Democratic side and believed, um, you know, we needed to hold out and fight for Medicaid expansion, or you're on the Republican side and, and felt like we just didn't need to deal with Medicaid expansion at this time, we just couldn't get over that, um, but then they came across uh, doing these mini budgets, and we've been pretty successful in doing those. Uh, just last week, we came back into town and did a mini budget for disaster relief, and also some DOT funding to address some of the shortages and problems that they were having. Um, I think that's an excellent idea to do with teacher pay, and so, you know, Democrats are willing to do that. We're willing to sit down and talk about just teacher pay and non-certified staff and getting them a raise. But the response that we have gotten back from Senate leadership has been that you have to override the, the entire budget. Um, and there's just a lot of disagreements in that budget, including a lot of the port projects, quite frankly, and the corporate tax cuts that are in there that we're just not willing to do. And so I think the mini budget is a way to do it. I think another idea would also be to come back in town and maybe do a special session just on educator pay, whether it's non-certified personnel, community colleges, uh, university employees like the Senator mentioned. Very good. Senator? Well, it's important for people to realize that the 3.9% that, that this the the both parties passed uh, is included. A lot of that's in those 15-year steps. Mm -hmm. uh, that ranges from 2.86% for a first-year teacher when right. she gets her thousand, right. and all the way down to about 2% through the year 15. Right. What really got held up by this budget was the 16 to 30-year-old teachers. Right. They had, you know, we start out, we raised uh, teacher pay. For the early teachers, to thirty-five thousand two years ago. Then right. we hit the middle folks, and we were making a swipe at the back end. Uh, who that was where the criticism was. We had neglected our older teachers, and we hadn't done that. But again, another important thing: we have collapsed this pay scale right. from a thirty-year to a fifteen. You get to the top of pay scale in fifteen years, basically. Over the life of a starting teacher. That collapsing that pay scale to 15 years from 30 will put about $200,000, a little over that, in a teacher's pocket from the day they walk in versus the old. Mm -hmm. That's because they get there in half the time, to the top. Because the step increases after 15 years only come every fifth year. Yeah, well, that, but, but I'm saying you get right. to that, that 30 year number in 15 years now. Mm -hmm. okay. Before you had to wait, and so you didn't get it. For the you know for the early years, you just had to wait, and you lost that extra income. Now we got to figure out how to do the back end. I think a little better. That, that's clear. That's not satisfactory to those folks. Yeah. Uh, but those early folks, that that's a pretty good obligation okay. to, to raise that step every year. So we know that we know that in every profession, salary does matter. Yeah. But there are other things that matter as well. And in recent years, there's been. Uh, decisions that have been made that, rel relative, that really impact also the working condition of the profession, of making the profession attractive. The elimination of master's degree pay, uh, the reduction of an elimination of career status for teachers, um, and uh, decreases in classroom supplies and materials. 
let's talk about how things beyond salary matter and what kind of initiatives the General Assembly has to address some of those things in the budget. Well, you know, you used a key word. You said profession, and right, and teachers, teachers, educators, it is a profession. It's mm -hmm. a profession that requires a four-year degree, um, and we need to treat them as such. Um, and it's all those things. We need to address all those things. Um, we need to re address class size, master pay, um, career status. I think those are all things that we need to address. But w you, you got to start at the top. And your question is, do you want to prioritize tax cuts or do you want to prioritize education spending? And, you know, that's not to say that one way is right and one way is wrong, but I would do things a little different. I would budget a little different. I would start and look at those needs and what we need. And what we've done is we have pick and choose. We chose one year we were going to give our beginning teachers more money and then we the middle. But what yep. we haven't done is done anything across the board yep. and nobody wants to make the same thing at year right. 15 that they make at year 30. Thank you. Yeah. Senator Horner, we've got about a minute left. Well, uh, closing thought. You won't get any argument on me on master's pay. Very I good. think Senate Bill 4 or 5 was mine and Danny Britt's to bring right. back master's pay. Um, but th that Aside, it, it's the I don't think it's a corporate tax cut issue that's given as much heartburn. That's a headline grabber, mm -hmm. but the main thing is that takes recurring money away. Right. It isn't so much the tax cut if if we spend it somewhere else, the money wouldn't be there for education. What really is I think causing a lot of heartburn is our approach on the skiff, and that's a whole other okay. topic. But right. that's pulling four percent off the top, right. and it. That and another reserve fund takes about a billion to a year of recurring money. Right. And it goes to debt service. And the governor would like, seven, right now, about 700 that's debt service. The governor would like to be able to spend that money. Right. Uh, that's the philosophical Thank thing. We are so delighted that both of you could be on the show this evening. We'd love to have you welcome back. Thank you for your service to North Carolina, what you're doing. And I know that you're trying to move things forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. After a brief commercial break, we'll be back to continue our discussion with two teachers from Cumberland and Wake Counties. But first, see if you can answer this question. What is the gap between the average pay for teachers in the highest and lowest paying school districts in North Carolina? Education Matters is brought to you each week in part by Town Bank, serving others enriching lives. Welcome back to Education Matters. Did you correctly answer D, more than $10,000? There is a substantial gap in average teacher pay across districts. Teachers in wealthier districts like Wake and Charlotte Mecklenburg offer much higher salary supplements than lower wealth districts, and they employ disproportionately greater numbers of teachers too. Because of this, teachers in four out of every five districts, 80%, receive less pay than the reported state average salary something to keep in mind when you hear reports about average teacher pay. Joining us now to talk about teacher pay and working conditions are two teachers, Tamika Walker-Kelly, an elementary teacher at Morganton Road in Cumberland County, and uh, Dane West, a history teacher at Night Nightdale High School here in Wake County. Mm -hmm. uh, Dane, we're going to start with you. I understand that uh, you're in your third year of teaching now, mm -hmm. and uh, that you had started teaching in Lee County, but just this past year moved to Wake. What kind of prompted your decision to make that move? I mean, there were multiple reasons. Um, obviously, I feel like the one that everyone would think about is that uh, sub the supplement being higher in Wake versus in Lee County, um, which does play a part. But when you factor in the cost of living adjustment in Wake, your rents for apartments are generally more expensive than what you see in Lee County. Um, so while the supplement is higher, it's not doesn't play out as much higher as you would think. Um, also, when I um, talk with people in Wake, they have like Office of, the office of e Equity Affairs and educational equity is something that I'm very passionate about. So to see Wake County Schools putting their money where their mouth was was attractive. Um, and just the way the Board of Education in Wake County worked together, they always seemed very um, pleasant with each other and professional and there was a little bit different situation in Lee County. So multiple reasons there. Very good. We're delighted to have you on the show. Thank, Thank you. you. Tamika, you're in your 13th year of teaching uh, in Cumberland County Schools as an elementary music teacher. Can you talk a little bit about, um, as a music teacher, the working conditions you faced in, say, over the past five years, and um, how 
the uncertainties around the teacher pay uh, increases this year um, have impacted your life and um, your classroom. Oh, well, thank you for having me today. Um, so I'll go back a little bit further. I entered the profession in 2007. And so right after that, the recession hit. And so like many teachers across the state of North Carolina, our pay was frozen. And that was a challenging time to work in. Um, a few years later, in 2013, we had very real and very deep cuts to public education take place in North Carolina. So we felt my school, our county, we felt the loss of teacher assistance in the classroom. We felt the loss of master's pay and longevity pay. And so that not only hindered our ability to make sure that we are providing a high quality public education for students, but it also contributed to school employee turnover, not just teachers, but we lost classified staff as well. Um, we had a lot of uneven pay raises during that time, um, but we still did not meet where we were when we were doing steps before. Um, and then, of course, as a music teacher, um, one of the things that our profession, our specialist category faced was the unfunded class size mandate that came down a few years ago. And so our positions were at risk. And so our art teachers, our music teachers, professional, uh, our um, physical education teachers, technology specialists, they were at risk at losing their jobs. Right now, in this budget impasse that we are in, our schools and our school boards are facing pressure to make sure that we are making sure and meeting the needs of the students that we currently have in our classroom, but we have to use last year's budget. And so schools, families can't operate like that. It's not fiscally responsible. And so it is a very difficult and challenging time when we're on this wait and see what's going to happen with the state budget. Very good, thank you. Uh, Dane, you're a relatively early career teacher now. You're mm -hmm. pretty close to what's happening in the field, even within the undergraduate field. Uh, there's been a substantial decline in teacher preparation programs, uh, and you've kind of seen the, uh, the, how it's distracted people from entering the profession. Uh, what should the state be doing differently to support teachers in classrooms and to encourage other folks to come into the profession? I mean, so working in high school, we are the, that stepping stone to a, post, to a college degree. Um, and I can attest the fact that our students are not ignorant of the fact um, that we are struggling as educators. Um, I teach freshmen, and I love my kids, and it breaks my heart every once in a while when they say that, you know, I could never be a teacher because you <laughs> y'all don't make enough money. Right. Um, and so the state needs to invest in our schools. Yeah. Um, they need to bring back things like the teaching fellows, but not in every more schools than they have now, including to try and attract more educators of color. Um, and, you know, our starting salary right now is $35,000. If you go back 12 years, 2007, um, when our high school seniors were in kindergarten, adjusted for inflation, that was about $35,180. Our purchasing power is less now than it was 12, 13 years ago. And that shows up. Tamika, as we talked a little bit about in the first segment or so, Governor Cooper decided to veto um, the Republicans' 3.9 percent pay raise increase. Um, and I'm hearing a lot of teachers actually have supported the veto and supported that move. Uh, and the fact that it even means going into the holidays without a teacher pay raise. What's your reactions to the latest development and what do you hope to see happen? So my reaction is just like many other educators across the state. We were very supportive of Governor Cooper vetoing this budget proposal. And one of the reasons why is because it actually didn't fund any raises for those educators from zero to 15 years. And it provided very minimum, like less than or almost about $30 for our most veteran educators. And they do deserve a raise. We all do. We deserve to be paid as professionals. and. Another thing that the proposal did that um, a lot of people don't talk about is that it left out some of our lowest paid school workers, which are our classified staff, who are still not making minimum wage, at least $15 an hour. And so one of the things that we talk about as educators, it takes all of us to collaborate and work together to support a child in a school building. The school building runs with all of us, not just some of us. And so the proposal that was put forth by the Republican-led General Assembly 
wasn't adequate at all. And so we are understanding that we are actually working together, we're in this together, and we want to make sure that everybody is paid adequately and professionally. Very good. Um, the uh, General Assembly, is they moving forward and looking like they're going to be coming back uh, in early January? Mm -hmm. Uh, the situation is going to be the same. What would be um, your hope that will happen when the new year gets here? Um, so one <laughs> thing, I, I, I would like for them to continue to do what the people of North Carolina elected them to do, which is work together to negotiate a fully funded public education program within a budget that they are going to pass, that they are going to work together on a bipartisan effort to make sure that is done. We also want them to reconsider and invest. One of the things that they did was invest the corporate tax cut they gave them to corporations, but not to schools. And North Carolina already has one of the lowest corporate tax rates in the nation. And so that money could be invested in school bonds. That money could be invested in teacher retention, recruitment, and physical bodies in a school building that we need to make schools successful. Zane, as you Dane, as you go close in on your third year mm -hmm. and you look down the road to the future, um, what are your aspirations? You know, I, I want to be a teacher until I can retire. Um, it's the only thing I've thought about doing for many years now. Um, but when I look at our salary schedule, I look at the, re the lack of respect that I feel like our lawmakers give our profession. Um, when I go forward and try to want to start a family one day, mm -hmm. I have to look at, can I lo logistically afford to stay a teacher? Okay. And I don't know that answer right now. Thank you both for being here and hope that each of you and your students have a great Thanksgiving holiday and thank you for sharing your time. You. After this break, this week's final word. Ask any successful business leader what she cites as the key to her success and she will put the quality of her employees at or near the top of the list. And when it comes to the business of teaching and learning in our state's public schools, our nearly 95,000 teachers are undoubtedly the heart of the organization. Each day, our teachers, with the support of other school-based staff, challenge our students to achieve new and higher standards of academic achievement and personal development. On an annual basis, North Carolina needs to fill over 7,500 teacher vacancies at the start of each new school year. At a time when our state's pipeline for cultivating future teachers has declined by nearly 30% since 2011, we must accelerate our effort as a state to regain the ground we've lost since 2002, when we ranked 20th in the nation in teacher pay. Making teacher salaries more competitive is an essential ingredient to rebuilding our teacher pipeline and to recruiting, retaining, and recognizing quality teachers this year as the new school year approaches. To strengthen our state's commitment to its children, we employ our leaders of the North Carolina General Assembly and Governor Cooper to find common ground on a significant teacher salary increase as we approach this holiday season. This critical decision will recognize the value our current teachers add to leading our classrooms today, as well as send a message to our high school and college students that it's worth pursuing a career in teaching. Our state is fortunate to have realized increased revenues after the most recent economic recession, and we have the resources to make this investment in our educators now. Let's invest what is at the heart of every school, every child's school day, her teacher. That's it for this week's show. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.